Hey, a &P students, welcome to our second lecture on the integumentary system. Last time we met, we talked about some general things in the integument integumentary system. We talked about one particular structure in the skin, which is this superficial layer here, which is the epidermis. So last time we did the epidermis. We looked at all the different strata there, talked about the different layers and cells. Today, we are doing the dermis. Dermis literally means skin. And this totally makes sense because it is the biggest, it is the thickest layer of the skin. No matter where you are in the skin, dermis is always going to be the thickest, okay? Stratum corneum is pretty darn big in your palms and in your plantars, but the dermis is always the winner. Now, in that dermis, we generally separate it into a top and a bottom portion. Better yet, a superficial and a deep portion. The superficial fifth or so, it's roughly 20%, right, is called the papillary dermis. So right in, right in here, this is all papillary dermis, basically. Check out the bumps. The bumps are crucial to the name. So that's all papillary dermis there. Then the other lower, deeper, four-fifths, or 80%, is the reticular dermis. So all this down here is reticular dermis. The reticular dermis is really the biggest part of your skin. Of all the sublayers of skin, remember there were five sublayers in the epidermis, and now we realize there are two in the dermis. So of all seven, it is the reticular that is the big winner. It is the thickest. It is the strongest. So let us talk a little bit about these two parts of the dermis. Starting with the papillary dermis, which, like I said a moment ago, is the upper one-fifth, 20% or so. So I'm going to put a green line here. This green line is going to mark my stratum basale, which is the deepest part of my epidermis, right? Right. All right, so what else I see here, all the other stuff that I see here, let's outline that with some purpleness. All the other stuff here is the papillary dermis. It is mostly made out of good old areolar connective tissue. Mostly made out of good old areolar connective tissue, which remember has collagen in it, has elastic fibers in it, has mast cells, fibroblasts, macrophages, all important stuff. Areolar connective tissue is there to support the epidermis. That is what it is going to do. It is going to physically support it. It is going to also support it in terms of delivery of food and oxygen. I want you to notice this little oval structure right there. That is a blood vessel right there. I can see some little red blood cells in here. Here's another blood vessel down here. Another blood vessel over here. Here's one over here as well, another one over here. There are blood vessels galore in the papillary dermis. It is vascular. This contrasts with the avascular situation we had up here in the epidermis. So the vascularity of the papillary dermis is going to help me feed the cells up here. All right. There's more. Why do we even call it papillary dermis? Well, it's because it has papillae. Papillae means bumps. If you take off the E, you get papilla. That is a singular. That is just a bump. This is a papilla right here. This is a dermal papilla. Got to make sure we use the word dermal. There are other papillae in other places in our body. We have papillae in our tongue, for example. But these papillae, these upward projections, 
they are going to anchor themselves to downward projections of the epidermis. So this part of the epidermis coming down here is called an epidermal ridge. The epidermal ridges are going to interlock with the dermal papillae that's going to anchor those guys together and provide a strong structural attachment between the dermis and the epidermis so these two layers don't slide too much and don't separate. Occasionally they do slide and separate. If you've ever gotten a, a blood blister, maybe on your foot or on your hand or something, you've separated your dermis and your epidermis and blood has pooled in there. Okay, I think that's it for this slide. Let's keep on going. Ooh, we can see some of these epidermal ridges and these dermal papillae very nicely. So what is that one right there? Is that an epidermal ridge or is that a dermal papilla? If you shout it out, dermal papilla, you are absolutely right. And of course, that means these guys over here, these guys must be the epidermal ridges. And they really anchor well together. They interlock together. Now, this is thin skin here. I know that because I see hair and I see one, two, three, four layers in my epidermis. If it were thick skin, we might see even bigger epidermal ridges, even bigger dermal papillae to anchor them better together better so that we can absorb more damage, deal with more friction, etc. All right. Do you remember when I said there were a bunch of blood vessels in that papillary dermis? Well, the abundance of those dermal blood vessels the abundance of the dermal blood vessels let me deliver heat to the skin surface. Now, I want to deliver heat to the skin surface when my body temperature is going up. So if you look at this young lady here, she looks like she's been running or exercising outside. Her face is very flushed. Her face is flushed because the blood vessels in her face in the dermis there are dilating. They're doing some vasodilation where the blood vessels open up. And when they open up, blood rushes in. When blood rushes in, it brings heat. And when you bring heat that close to the surface, that heat can radiate away. Um, this happens, you know, when you are hot, it is a homeostatic negative feedback mechanism to help you cool down. Temperature goes up. Dermal blood vessels vasodilate, increase the blood flow to the skin, more blood flow, more heat flow, more heat flow at the surface, you're going to have heat loss. Um, if you have a sunburn, your skin will feel warm because all the damage to the cells that the, the UV radiation did is going to prompt the release of chemicals that cause blood vessels to dilate to try and come and facilitate the healing process. If you, I mean, pretty much anytime you bring blood to the skin surface, you are bringing heat. Now, similarly, if you constrict those blood vessels, if you constrict those dermal blood vessels, Less heat is going to get to the surface. If less heat gets to the surface, you lose less heat, and therefore you stay warmer. All right. Excellent. Let's talk an about another role that those abundant blood vessels play. So remember, we got abundant blood vessels in the papillary dermis. Those blood vessels, of course, are filled with blood. Blood is filled with, okay, heat. We just did heat. It's also filled with blood cells, of course. It's filled with oxygen, carbon dioxide, water, nutrients, waste, all sorts of things. But it's also filled with a precursor to vitamin D. Now, I don't want you to memorize the names of things here. What I do want you to know, though, is that in those blood vessels in your dermis, 
you have this compound, 7-dehydrocholesterol. Don't worry about that name. But know that it is a precursor, a precursor to active vitamin D. And what happens is the UV radiation from sunlight hits that precursor and starts this reaction. It turns that precursor into something else, which that next chemical then goes to the liver, gets turned into something else, then goes to the kidney, and finally gets turned into active vitamin D, which is going to be very, very important for maintaining your calcium balance and for many other things in your body. Now, doesn't mean the skin and sunlight are the only way to get vitamin D. Of course, if you are drinking fortified milk, if you are eating some, some salmon, maybe you're making a, a smoothie with salmon and whole milk in it, that would be delicious. Then you go, you drink that in the sunshine, that would be the killer approach to getting a lot of vitamin D in your body. People sometimes say, vitamin D is in sunlight. Well, no, it's not in sunlight, but the UV radiation in the sunlight kickstarts this chemical reaction involving your liver and your kidneys, which then ends up producing active vitamin D. Okay, on that note, let's look at one quick example got some kids here working in a factory. That's not good. They're working in a factory. Looks like maybe they're working at a textile mill or something. And kids going to work, kids going to work in factories, work in serious long hours, can lead to this. Whoops. Come on, draw with me. Oh, it doesn't want to let me draw. Oh, I see why. There we go. I didn't have it. There we are. Kids working in factories can lead to this and this. So it's basically, basically what's going on here. Kids are spending too much time indoors, not getting the sunlight. If they're going to work, they're probably not getting, you know, that a super great diet at home not getting the dietary sources of vitamin D, you know, good amounts of of meat and fish and that sort of thing. And if they're not getting it from the sun, they're not getting it from their diet, they are not going to have enough vitamin D. Without enough vitamin D, calcium balance goes awry, and the bones start to get weaker. The bones are like your, your bank for calcium in your body. You need calcium for nerve signaling, for muscle contraction, for blood clotting, things that if you don't do them, you die. So your body will take calcium from your bone to power those other events so that you don't die. But when you take calcium from bone, what happens? The bone gets softer, the bone gets weaker, and it becomes harder for the bone to support the weight. And we see that here. So, this is a great real-world example. Not doesn't really happen too much anymore. Um, there's probably, there's still a lot of vitamin D deficiency out there in a lot of folks. But, you don't see this, this, this is called rickets, by the way. You don't see this rickets in children the way you might have, you know, 150 years ago. All right, on that note, my friends... Let's keep going. Let's talk about that reticular dermis, that lower four-fifths or 80%. It is not quite as interesting, to be honest with you. It is dense, irregular connective tissue, which you met in lab. What does that word dense tell you? That word dense tells you it is rich in what? It is rich in, you got it, you guessed it, collagen. It's also irregular. That means the collagen fibers are going in many different directions that makes us strong in many different directions. Structural integrity, that's the name of the game for the reticular dermis. Making that protective layer strong. All right, beautiful. Let's keep on going. We only have a little bit more to do, guys. 
we got to now talk about some of the appendages of the skin. These are things that are in the skin. They're not really, you know, we don't want to, we don't call them the dermis or the epidermis, but they're actually derived from the epidermis and they exist in the skin. There are four appendages, sweat glands, subbaceous glands, hair, and nails. We're going to talk about three of them. We are going to ignore nails. Okay, let's do it. Let's talk about sweat glands first. There are two varieties of sweat glands. There are the marocrine sweat glands. You have millions of marocrines. Marocrines maintain body temperature. And then there are the apocrines. Apocrines are your armpit ones. A for apocrine, A for axillary or armpit. All right, which one are we doing first? I think we're doing marocrine first. Yes, I am correct. We got about 3 million marocrine sweat glands. Here is one. Let's draw, let's point one out right here. There's one right there. Beautiful duct and coiled tube. Pore opening to the surface right there. Another one hiding right there as well. These are exocrine glands. What that means is they secrete stuff onto a body surface. They have some sort of secretion. In this case, of course, it's sweat, and it goes onto a body surface. That's what exocrine means. So like your salivary glands, exocrine. Your sweat glands, exocrine. These guys have a coiled tube and a duct. The sweat that they make is very watery with some ions. Might, maybe you've tasted the saltiness of sweat before. There are wastes as well, and there are even antibodies, immune proteins, which is kind of cool. Now, water is the, the main guy, though, because when the water gets on your, on your skin, ideally what you want the water to do is to simply evaporate. When it evaporates, it turns, fr turns from a liquid into a gas. That requires heat. That heat comes from your body. So sweat evaporating steals body heat from you, cools you down. That's why in a humid day when the sweat doesn't evaporate, you feel even hotter. When it's a dry heat, when you're hanging out in Phoenix, when you're uh, over in Arizona, you don't feel quite as awful at the same temperature as you might have felt around here. Okay, fantastic. Let's keep on going. You guys are doing awesome, I hope. Ooh, here's a beautiful histology of a sweat gland. Look at that. You can see the duct and the coiledness of the tube. So much of the sweat gland is deep into the reticular dermis. The duct goes up, 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 up through the papillary dermis, and then it's going to open up at the epidermis. Pretty neat. All right, what about those apocrine glands? Apocrine glands are found in a couple A regions, the axillae. It's the plural of axilla, which is your armpit. The, around the anus, so a pair of A's right there, as well as in the pubic region. Apocrine glands are exocrine as well. That means they're emptying a secretion onto a body surface. Now, there's still a coiled tube, and we see the coiled tube right here. Here's our coiled tube, I'm going to put a little circle around that guy. And there's still a duct, there's a duct right there. But one of the differences about these glands is they empty into a hair follicle. Okay? And these are all places where you are going to find hair. And the hair will actually hold on to the African sweat better than if you were just going on to, you know, just onto the skin itself without going into a hair follicle. So this actually helps you retain this sweat. Now, what's interesting about the sweat is it has more lipids in it, it has more proteins. So in other words, it has more nutrients. More nutrients means they're going to get broken down by bacteria. And bacteria, when they break things down, they make their own waste products. And those waste products of bacteria, those are what can account for the odor that these sweat glands, that this type of sweat 
can have. Now, a lot of animals in the animal kingdom use this type of sweat to mark their territory. We don't do that. We don't rub our armpits in our mailbox or anything like that, generally speaking. Other animals, other mammals, use this type of secretion to attract mates, to let mates know that, hey, it is, it is breeding season. And again, I'm pretty sure we don't do that with the sweat either. So these are a type of structure that we would probably best consider vestigial because they don't really have a function in us anymore, but we still got them. All right, let's do another gland. I think we have another gland coming up. Yeah, this is one that we've never mentioned so far. Didn't mention this guy in lab. Haven't mentioned it yet in lecture. These are glands called ceruminous glands. They are modified sweat glands that you find in your ear canal, your external ear, where, you, where you're not supposed to stick a Q-tip, but maybe, you, maybe you've done that on occasion. So in this ear canal, this external ear canal, and by the way, check out the three bones in the middle ear right there. Amazing tiny bones. Now, these modified sweat glands in the external ear canal, they secrete something called cerumen, better known as ear wax. Primarily, it serves as a bactericidal chemical, so it helps kill bacteria. It's got some fungicidal and some insect repellent properties as well which is pretty darn neat. You know, three things you don't really want crawling, growing in your ear canal. Okay, later on, and when I say later on, I mean at the end of A&P2, we'll talk about another type of modified sweat glands, which are the mammary glands. So when we do the reproductive system in A&P2, we'll do one final type of modified sweat gland. All right. One more gland to go today and that's the sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands are also, whoops, they're also exocrine, meaning they secrete something onto a body surface. By the way, ceruminous glands were, of course, exocrine too. Sebaceous glands, they are going to branch off hair follicles as well. So similar to apocrine sweat glands in that regard. And these sebaceous glands make this moisturizing chemical called sebum. It helps keep your skin moist. It's also kind of bactericidal. Now, even though we have these sebaceous glands and we have this natural moisturizer, that doesn't mean we still can't get dry, dry skin, especially in the winter when the air is dry and water quickly evaporates, moisture evaporates from our skin. Now... We don't have any of these sebaceous glands in two regions. Can you guess what they are? Maybe we mentioned in the lab. I hope we did. The two regions are the palmar and the plantar regions. Now, why don't we have sebaceous glands there? Well, there we have what kind of skin? Thick skin. And thick skin lacks what? Hair follicles. Hair. And without hair, you don't have sebaceous glands. All right, you might be wondering why I've got some cute little sheep down here. If you ever um, are putting some moisturizing lotion on yourself, check the ingredients. It may have an ingredient called lanolin, which is a really good moisturizer. And it is actually the sebum from sheep. So it's entirely possible that you have put sebum from sheep on your skin. Just wanted to, you know, let you know that fact. All right, we got two more things to talk about, I think. Ooh, before we get there, check out that beautiful sebaceous gland right there. Here's the hair right here. There's the hair. And there's the sebaceous gland right there. Pretty neat. Speaking of hair, let's talk about hair. We have hair basically all over our body. No hair in the palmar or plantar regions, of course. We have... Lots of hair on our top of our head. I used to, at least. Um, this is good because humans are bipedal. So that hair on the top of our heads gives us some good protection from the sunshine. We also have hair in our axillary and pubic regions. Um, this is 
uh, probably vestigial too. Remember that hair catches the African sweat, which we don't really use to mark our territory or attract mates like other mammals sometimes do. Now, if you look at a hair, we can see the part coming out of your, of your epidermis, which is the shaft. Then the deeper part is the root. So the deeper part is the root. And then the root has this kind of wide part at the bottom called the bulb. And in that bulb, you find a little cluster of blood vessels called the hair papilla. And that's basically feeding the living cells that are going to surround the hair and also help be responsible for hair growth and making the hair. And so that's the follicle. So these blood vessels in the hair papilla feed the follicle, which then is going to allow cells to divide. And cells divide and cells become keratinized and added to the hair and the hair grows. And it actually it's pretty complicated, like how hair growth works and the cycles it goes through and phases and stuff. And a little beyond our scope. Um, one of the things that does happen, often of course to gentlemen, because of testosterone, the blood vessels in this hair papilla start to really constrict. And it denies nutrients to the living parts of the hair. And those living parts of the hair die, and the hair dies as well. And that is going to be what causes guys to go bald. All right. Now, you may wonder, well, why do we have hair everywhere? Well, hair is pretty cool in that you almost always have nervous system structures attached to it. So when the hair gets bumped by something, so if something brushes the hair on your skin, you're aware of that because brushing the hair deforms it slightly, which causes it to signal the neighboring nerve cells. Okay. Awesome. Let's look at a histology picture here just for fun. We see a lot of hair follicles, so hair follicles, all these pinkish things right here, hair follicles, the bulb of the hair is down here, the papilla as well. Okay, almost done. This is the last slide, in fact, guys. Last but not least, there is this little band of smooth muscle, this little ribbon of smooth muscle right there. I wonder if we can see one. Yeah, there's one right there on that histology slide. It's called an erector pili. Erector sounds kind of like the word erect, right? Erect, erect. Erector means straightener. Pili means hair. So it is a straightener of the hair. And these muscles are going to contract in response to cold temperature and getting scared, turning on your, your what's called your fight or flight response. And when these muscles contract, the hair stands on end, like we can see in this beautiful chimpanzee here. And when the hair stands on end, it is called piloerection. In you and me, it causes goosebumps. In other furrier mammals, it does two things. It makes them look scarier. So that's why it's turned on. This reflex is turned on when you're doing like a fight or flight response. Now, it also, the hair standing up like this, traps more air near your skin, which provides an insulating layer of warm air, which helps you keep warm. So for you and me, though, erection does nothing, nothing of the sort. We don't look scarier. We don't have enough hair to trap an insulating layer of air. So this is another example of a vestigial structure, one that makes sense when we consider our distant relatives, a structure we've just kind of hung on to. All right. With that, we are absolutely, utterly done with the integumentary system. We are done with the material for the first lecture exam. Yes, yes, that is awesome. So, good luck on that test. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of really great scores. So study for that test. And I will see you when we do our next lecture, which is on bone tissue. All right. Bye-bye.